The UK is the world's largest net exporter of financial services. Yet away from us skyscrapers in London, we now worry about whether our schools will collapse. The NHS, once a source of great pride, a pioneer of free healthcare around the world, now struggles under surging waiting lists and a backlog of repairs and buildings needed fixing. At current rates of economic growth, Polish wages could exceed the UK within 15 years. The crisis of confidence in basic infrastructure is symbolic of a country which seems to have lost its way, lurching from one crisis to another. On its return, Parliament debated the concrete crisis with a few token references to bottoms, a feeble nod to the Education Secretary's bizarre interview, where she pointed out at least she wasn't sitting on her arse. But whilst our parliamentarians try to make a few cheap jokes, years of underinvestment is a serious problem with no easy solution. But the question is, can anything be done about it? Well, one big long-term problem is the lack of capital investment in recent decades. Since the post-war period, capital investment in the UK has fallen significantly. In the 60s and 70s, there was considerable investment in housing, schools, hospitals. But the problem is that a lot of the new buildings in that era was built using a cheap aerated concrete that is now at risk of crumbling. In 2003, the Labour government did have a plan to refurbish all of England's secondary schools. But in 2010, in the aftermath of a great financial crisis and rising budget deficits, the new Conservative government embraced austerity. The mantra was, we can't afford it. Education as a department was particularly badly hit, and there were deep cuts to both current and capital spending. Because if you want to cut government spending, the easiest is often to cut capital investment because there's no short-term political cost. But whilst it's easy to cut investment, it's very hard to rectify the situation. The infrastructure problems the UK has is not just about the past decade. It really goes back to the past uh, 30, 40 years. And compared to other countries in the OECD, the UK is near the bottom of the league table in terms of low public investment, say 50% less than France. And it's not just uh, government investment that has been low. It's also the private sector investment is one of the lowest in the OECD. UK investment was particularly hard hit since 2016 and all the Brexit uncertainties and costs of business. And it's not just investment, but also research and development in new technologies. The UK is one of the lowest in, compared to our major competitors. But interestingly, there was a surge in 2021, uh, due, partly due to COVID vaccine investment, a sign that the UK still has uh, some great potential. Now, the UK can change this poor record of investment, but it does need a change in mindset. Firstly, budgets need to think about the long term and not just the next day's uh, headlines. Also, there is money available. For example, whilst there's a reluctance to invest, pension spending has surged in recent years and is set to continue to rise because of the very expensive triple lock guarantee, which has seen pensions rise faster than wages. But Labour's proposals for public investment are so far relatively modest. They plan an increase of an extra £20 billion a year for mostly Green New Deal projects. But as a share of GDP, public investment will still be low. Under the government's current plans, capital investment is going to fall really quite quickly. Labour's plans will just slow the decline, but not enough to reverse decades of underinvestment. Now, just recently, the National Audit Office stated that 700,000 pupils are in schools in serious need of immediate repair. Now, if you want to look for good news, not all schools are affected. But the bad news is that the short-term concrete problem is also endemic in other buildings such as courts, prisons and hospitals. And so to fix the state of uh, public uh, buildings is going to take years of investment and billions of pounds. And there are already serious problems with, say, the justice system with a very significant backlog of cases waiting to come to court. And also, aside from the potential dangers to life and limb of crumbling buildings, there's also an economic cost in terms of lower productivity and lower growth as time is wasted. Now, one reason why public investment was so much higher in the post-war period is that in the past, the government, both local and central, used to build housing. Since the 1980s, social housing has been sold off but not replaced. Governments have really stepped back from building new houses. But this has led to an extreme shortage of both rented accommodation and also general houses, 
leading to a soaring of rents and in recent years higher house prices. And the young generation really face a tough time with stagnant real wages, higher tax burden. They also have the, the additional cost of really expensive uh, housing conditions, which takes a big chunk of disposable income. Now, in one uh, small sign of good news, recently the ONS made a very significant upward revision to GDP. Previously, it was thought UK GDP was still 0.6% below the pre-COVID peak. But after the revision, GDP was actually 1.2% higher. It's a bit like finding a £20 note down the back of a sofa, but you still have £1,500 rent to pay. The UK really went from being a dismal basket case to severely underperforming. It is no longer the worst performing country in the G7, but it doesn't really change uh, that much. It has no effect on tax revenue. It merely explains why tax revenues were better than expected given such low growth. And also it does nothing for the future prospects for growth, which are pretty uh, weak at the moment. Also, the revisions to GDP come from the difficulty of collecting lockdown economic activity. And it's quite likely that other countries may see similar upward revisions in GDP in the coming months. The truth is that the next government, whoever it is, will face a fairly unwelcome combination of low economic growth, quite possibly recession, but also uh, high interest rates and inflation still a problem. UK debt interest payments have soared in recent years due to the combination of high inflation and high interest rates. And whilst it's easy to talk about the desirability of investment, unless governments change their attitude to fiscal rules, there will be little change. UK debt is rising and there's no easy solution because low growth is hitting tax revenues and combined with an aging population and declining health, there's only going to be more pressures on government spending from day to day. Now, fiscal orthodoxy suggests there's very little room for manoeuvre and more belt tightening will be needed. However, when it comes to investment, austerity is really quite expensive. If you don't invest in infrastructure, it causes high costs, lost productivity and lower economic growth. Public investment in the right areas can create jobs, fix supply constraints and contribute to higher growth, which will boost tax revenues in the long term. The 2010s were a lost decade, a missed opportunity, because despite ultra low interest rates, investment was underwhelming, storing up problems which now need urgently addressing. And interestingly, not only did public investment remain weak, but also private investment fell behind our major competitors with low public sector investment kind of contributing to low private investment too. Now, since 2016, the uncertainty and cost of Brexit really led to an unprecedented fall in investment and negative impact on trade. And this is one area where the UK can improve in future years. For example, recently the government announced a re-entry to the EU Horizon Science Programme after a two-year Brexit hiatus. It's a reflection of a more pragmatic approach to the EU and the extreme partisanship of the initial Brexit debate is perhaps uh, dissolving. And even if the next government doesn't uh, rejoin the customs union single market, there's going to be much less uh, shocks to business, which will be more encouraging to investment compared to uh, recent years. Now, amidst all the bad news circulating around the UK economy, it is important to, to bear in mind the UK still is a rich country with a lot of assets and potential. In recent years, we've been somewhat better in growing wealth than income and a combination of external shocks and poor decision-making has led to underwhelming growth in productivity and slow economic growth. But the good news is there is scope for catching up or the uh, lost output of the past. There has been a genuine shock about the prospect of school roofs falling in, but hopefully this could be a point that galvanizes the country to aim for something higher and really make the um, commitment to invest in the future. Hope you liked this video. If you found it useful, you may also like this one on the parlous state of the uh, UK housing market. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe. Cheers.